All right, are there any questions about anything that we've covered so far in class? No, I'm seeing lots of no's. Okay. All right, then. Let's get back to where we were, which was on therapy. We were talking about therapy, and we were talking about drugs. And what I'd like to do here is to talk about drugs and drug therapy and evaluate the idea of drug therapy. So first of all, I have a question for you all, and that is, are the drug companies getting rich on, off the back of sick people? Do you think yes or no? Are they getting rich off the backs of sick people? And I'm seeing lots of yeses and yeses and yeses, and of course they are. <laughs> it's really a stupid question. They are drug companies. They sell to sick people. That's what their purpose is. So of course they're getting wealthy off the backs of sick people. The question is how wealthy are they getting and are they charging too much is really the question. But yes, that their whole purpose in life is to make products for sick people. That's what they do. So of course they're getting rich off the backs of sick people. But the question is, should they actually be making the amount of money that they do make? But besides that, uh, we know that in depression, for instance, therapy is better than or as good as drugs. Therapy is as good as drugs. And you know all the, we've talked about teaching a man to fish. And if you do therapy, then therapy is conclusive. You learn how to deal with your problem. But if you take drugs, then you have to keep going back, back, and back, and back, and back to get the drugs. So we, as psychologists, believe therapy is better when therapy can cover the problem. And yes, we might have to give drugs for a short period of time, but we want to eventually wean people off of the drugs. So drug companies are always developing better drugs and attempting to convince doctors to use the new drugs and rather than the generic drugs because the generic drugs don't make them as much money, they can't charge as much because a generic drug is made by more people than just that one company. They have the sole proprietorship of that drug for a short period of time because they spent a lot of money developing the drug and they should be able to make their money back from that drug from all the work that they did to develop it. So that's, um, that's drug companies. So yes, drug companies are getting wealthy off of the backs of sick people. But there's more to it than just that. Because physicians, your doctors, your psychiatrists and medical doctors can make more money prescribing your drug over your entire lifespan than they can doing therapy for a year. So you, you tell the, the patient, I, I'm going to give you this drug, and the patient takes the drug. They don't ask about therapy. So the physicians are culpable as well because they can make more money giving the drug and getting the money for you coming back every three months to get your new prescription. But if you do give the patient the option, you can come in twice a week for a year, or I can give you this drug, either or. And what patients will do is give me the drug. I don't want to come in twice a week for, for a year. That's, I don't want to, that's a waste of my time. So just give me the drug. So it's easier to get the drug and that's what you want is the drug. And so it's not as simple as blaming the drug culture that we have on drug companies. Instead, it's everybody's fault. It's all of our fault. And the drug the culture that predominates our society, everybody's culpable for it. The, the drug companies, the doctors, and the patients, all of them. It's not a simple answer, in other words. Some of the other biomedicals, we've talked about drugs now. There's three more biomedical technologies I want to talk about, and that is psychosurgery. And that is the prefrontal lobotomy, which we do not do anymore. It was going in through the eye, cutting off the, the frontal lobe and the frontal lobe would die and then the patient would be malleable or um, able to be controlled better. And this is specifically developed because there were people in medical hospitals in the psych wards that were restricted to straight jackets. They could never get out of a straight jacket. They were in a straight jacket for the rest of their lives. 
because they were extremely dangerous people. But if you cut the frontal lobe off, then they became malleable. So you could put them into the society of all the rest of the patients and they would not harm anybody and they would not harm themselves. So it was really easy to take care of them at that point. So it was a useful technique until, of course, drugs came along and you have specific drugs that shut down the frontal lobe but don't destroy the frontal lobe. And if you take the person off of the frontal lobe, uh, off of those drugs, their frontal lobe will come back online again. So it isn't a permanent issue giving the person drugs. The main culprit for prefrontal lobotomies was finally stripped of his license because he was doing prefrontal lobotomies on people over and over again because he didn't get it right. And, it, and he killed people. But taking a person who has, a, uh, who has an issue like a person who has needs to be in a straitjacket for the rest of their lives and giving them a prefrontal lobotomy may make them uh, able to be controlled. But give them a dime or a quarter to go down to the, to the vending machine. By the time they get down to the vending machine to buy what they want with that quarter, they've already forgotten what it is that they went down there for and they've been distracted by everything else that's going on around them. You could take a person who has a prefrontal lobotomy, put food in front of them, they'll eat until they're full, take away the food, they're still sitting there, wait a little bit, put food in front of them, they'll start eating again. They, they've lost a connection between their knowledge of what's going on in the world around them, and so they have to be cared for for the rest of their lives. And this person started doing prefrontal lobotomies on teenagers because the teenagers weren't paying attention to their parents. Well, let's give them a prefrontal lobotomy and then they'll, pay, they'll be controlled by their parents then. And that's just, that is absolutely the bad use of a prefrontal lobotomy. So severing the corpus callosum is um, done for people who have very bad episodes of epilepsy that will kill them. They're dangerous and, to themselves. And so we cut the corpus callosum so that only half of the brain becomes epileptic. The other half of the brain does not because you can't communicate now between the two parts of the brain. So the electrical stimulation that's occurring in one side does not cross to the other side. And you now have a split brain patient, which we talked about a little bit as well. Then there's pain perception. Some people have so much pain in their lives that they are disabled. They can't move. They can't do anything. Their life is unbearable because of the pain. And there is a way in certain cases to cut the pain fibers so that pain does not be, is not sent to their uh, brain anymore so that they don't know that they're in pain. And this is certainly useful to that person, but also extremely dangerous, just like drugs have side effects. This has a side effect. And that is, if I'm talking to you and I lean back against the kitchen counter and I'm talking to you and I feel something dribbling down my back. It's like, what is that? You know? And I pull the knife out of my back that I just leaned on and it's stuck into my back. But I didn't feel it because I have no pain anymore. That's dangerous and we can get into a lot of trouble if we don't feel pain. There are children born without pain and they are dangerous to themselves. You know, we have itchy skin so we scratch. And I only scratch so hard because if I scratch any harder, it hurts. If you don't have pain fibers, you're ripping the skin right off of your face. Uh, there's children who will run up against a wall, bang off the wall, bounce off it, go run and hit another wall and bounce off. They're bruising themselves. They're breaking bones. And they don't know it. They don't have any pain. It's hard to control. They jump out of trees, break their arm. Uh, jump off couches and, and, and sprain their legs, and they don't know that they've hurt themselves because they have no pain. So pain is important, but of course, if it gets to be too much for a person to handle, we can have ways to deal with it. And we wouldn't pay, cut the pain perception fibers first. What we would do is try to do a, um, a drug therapy to try to reduce the pain. But if that doesn't work, we can cut pain fibers. Electroconvulsive therapy has a bad reputation because it's used in movies as a punishment. That's not what it's for. It is not to punish a patient. It is to help the patient's brain to reboot. So
So we could put electrodes on either side of a, of a patient's head and then run electricity through to the other electrode out through the brain. So there's electricity going through the brain, through the corpus callosum, out the other side. And because it's electricity, it sets off the neurons. The neurons then set off other neurons, which set off other neurons, and you go into an epileptic seizure. And you do not do this while the person's awake. You knock the person out just like you would in regular surgery. You knock them out, you put on the electrodes, you have this grand mal seizure, and because of the electricity being flown through the head, and then they come out of it. And if they had depression, they no longer have depression. Depression is taken care of, the symptom of depression is taken care of by this electroconvulsive therapy for a long period of time before it will come back again. It will come back again. Uh, but there's a couple of side effects to it as well, because you're flowing electricity through the brain. But in what we see in movies is the person did something bad, so they grab them, they throw them into the electroconvulsive uh, therapy room, they tie them down, they're awake the whole time while they're being connected up and they have this horrible sensation. We put the person under anesthesia first and then we have the electroconvulsive and they wake up from that process not even knowing that it happened to them, feeling much better, except for the side effects. The left side of the brain is for speech, both production of speech and understanding speech. And you're flowing electricity through it. And so when they come out of their electroconvulsive therapy for a while afterwards, they cannot speak very well and they don't understand speech very well. So those are the side effects. There's also some retroactive memory loss as well. So they lose a little bit of their memories uh, what their phone number is, their address, you know, little pieces of memory that do come back. But that is, that is some of the side effects of electroconvulsive therapy. I don't know a therapy that doesn't have side effects that is biomedical. All biomedical therapies have side effects. All drugs have side effects. Therapy itself does not have a side effect except to be able to use that therapy later and the knowledge that you have gained from it in case this particular symptom comes back again. But there's a new one, transcranial magnetic stimulation. This is still considered a, um, a therapy that is being tested according to insurance companies. I don't know if they're paying for it yet. I do know that it exists in Virginia Beach. There is a transcranial magnetic stimulation machine in Virginia Beach that you can go to for depression, and it's just running magnets around the head. And as you run the big giant magnet around the head, it sets up an electrical field in your neurons, and you have sort of an, an, electric, an epileptic seizure. But it doesn't produce the same type of side effects that the electroconvulsive therapy does, and it turns out that it's better for bipolar as well as depression and schizophrenia, it helps. So I'm thinking in the near future that we won't even be talking about electroconvulsive therapy as a technique used anymore. It'll be transcranial magnetic stimulation instead. Does that make sense? You all getting that? Okay, seeing lots of yeses. Well, that's a very that's the different types of therapy. And therapy is performed in a situation with a therapist and the client or a group therapy. Uh, but when you're talking about mental health issues that are really severe and placing a person into a mental ward, in the old days, those mental wards, in the very beginning, those mental wards were prisons. That's basically what it was. You looked at this person as a useless, worthless human being, and you put them in a prison cell inside this giant um, asylum. And the people who spoke for those, the advocates for mental health patients, said, get them out of the institutions, deinstitutionalize them, which I understand that because they shouldn't, be, they shouldn't be cared for, if that's what you call it, cared for in that way. They should be given as good a life as they can and cared for in the best possible way. And certainly a prison is not the place for them to be. So there is a new type of hospital we call a therapeutic community. 
a therapeutic community, when you're inside of a hospital, there are doctors wearing white, you know, with the stethoscopes around their necks and the nurses are wearing their uniforms and it smells very antiseptic and you're hearing all the noises that sound like hospital noises. And it, you are aware, very aware that you are sick and you have an instant reminder constantly that you are in a hospital and you are sick. So it's very difficult to get better if you're consist consistently reminded that you're sick. So a therapeutic community takes away the hospital situation. The doctors and nurses are all dressed like normal people. Your room is set up with your, with your um, pictures of your family, the typical things that you would have in your room at home. So it's like you're at home instead of in a, in a hospital setting. And it tries to make the institutional environment more supportive and humane for the patients. It makes it home instead of an antiseptic hospital. And this seems to work very well. And this is really what should have happened. Instead of closing down Dorothea Dix and some of the other asylums we had, we should have built therapeutic communities, moved the patients into those communities, and destroyed the buildings that were made to be more like prisons and built new therapeutic communities. But instead, we just threw them out onto the street into what we called community mental health centers. So the community mental health center movement, the CMHCs, were an effort to deinstitutionalize mental health patients and to provide therapy from outpatient clinics in their home area, wherever they were born, wherever their families were. We were sending them back to their counties and their communities where they were taken from and placed into the asylums and let them live in their communities. The problem with that was that the state of North Carolina did not fund these very well, so they were understaffed and underfunded, and it didn't work out very well. I worked, I worked in the community mental health center here in this area called Albemarle Mental Health Center for a number of years. Albemarle AMHC was the largest. It covered seven counties. We had like 10 or 12 different facilities where people could be seen. But the state got rid of them and instead put in what we call now local management entities, which are given all the money from the state. The local management entity has the money, and then the, they get to determine what private person you're going to go to see for your particular issue, and then they will pay that private individual from the state funds that they get. Again, not enough money and we don't have enough private people to handle it. They need the larger community mental health centers. So the CMHEs were usually underfunded and understaffed, and patients ended up back in the hospitals within a few years on the streets. Lots of those who are homeless on the street are mental health patients, and they end up back in hospitals if there is a hospital, or they end up in jail or prison. And in jail and prison, they don't get any kind of help at all for their mental health. At least in the asylums, they were getting some help for it, some help for it. So it's not working out very well. Their families that um, had them institutionalized don't want them home. So they're living on the streets. And said people that interact with them on the streets don't like them. And is their life on the street any better than the life they would have gotten in a hospital? especially in one of the therapeutic community hospitals. It appears that the expense is smaller in the CMHCs, but that appearance doesn't evaluate the conditions under which these people are forced to live. They don't get proper food, they don't get proper shelter, they don't get proper sanitation, and a lot of times they didn't get the proper care that they needed either. If they're in an institution, they're always being seen by the nurses and the caretakers of that institution. Out on the street, they don't necessarily go to their therapy when they're supposed to and get their drugs or their therapies when they're supposed to. And that's the end of the therapy section. Are there any questions on therapy? I'm seeing a lot of no's. Okay, then let us go to social psychology, our last of, of our units, social psychology. Remember, Social psychology studies groups of people. 
and so do sociologists. They study groups of people. But sociologists are looking at the group of people as a group. And in social psychology, we're looking at the group of people to determine how one person is affected by the group dynamics. So it's a very different approach to how we approach groups. So how we define social psychology, while well, Gordon Alport, he, he defined it as social psychology is the study of the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors of individuals as they are shaped by the actual imagined or implied presence of other people. You go to a convenience store and there's a little camera with a little light that's blinking. And you change your behavior because you know that you're being videotaped. Although in most convenience stores, it's a little plastic box that looks like a camera with a little beeping, blinking light on it. And there's nothing else. There's no electronics in it whatsoever. You don't need the electronics. All you need is the implied presence that there are other people watching you and people change their behavior. So you need to put up a whole bunch of, of electronics to record all the activity. And in many cases, they don't. Many books describe social psychology as the branch of psychology that studies the effects of social variables and cognition on individuals' behavior and social interactions. Very similar definition. So what we will be studying in this particular chapter is behavior that's related to society, group decision-making, obedience, conformity, authority, bystander effect, interpersonal attraction, which is the one that most people enjoy, that one, what attracts you to another person, attitudes and attitude changes like prejudice and stereotyping and aggression, and we'll finally end it on altruism. Altruism is uh, a positive aspect of social psychology that we can study. So first of all, social psychologists believe that even when the situation is a familiar one, such as a college classroom, which you're very familiar with, or your home, as you're sitting there right now, the primary determinant of an individual's behavior is the social, social situation in which the behavior occurs. Your house, the school, a pizza parlor, a movie theater, wherever you happen to be, that situation can be so powerful that it sometimes dominates our personality and overrides our past history of learning values and beliefs. In other words, we do things that would, we would never do if we weren't in that particular situation. The situation can be very powerful. Social roles, which we will talk about, competition, or the mere presence of others can profoundly influence how we behave. We usually adapt our behavior to the demands of the social situation, and we're very good at figuring out what the social situation is if we're not Asperger's. If we're Asperger's, it's a little more difficult to figure it out. You can be around an entire group of people, and just looking at the people, you get immediate feedback of how that person is feeling. Normal individuals without Asperger's can tell every single person in the room how they're feeling, if they're depressed, if they're happy, if they're sad, uh, if they're anxious. We can tell. No problems. Immediate feedback. An Asperger's person cannot. They need to really concentrate to be able to figure out how people are. And so we usually, if, we're, if we are a person in the normal distribution curve in the 68%, we usually adapt our behaviors to the demands of the social situation. And in ambiguous situations where we can't really figure out what's going on, we take our cues from the behavior of the other people in that situation who also probably have no idea what they're doing. And so we're mimicking people who also don't know what they're doing either. So just because other people are behaving all of them the same way doesn't mean that they all know what they're doing. They're just mimicking what everybody else is doing. So situationism, that's called conforming, by the way. And we'll talk about that. So situationism is a view in social psychology that environmental conditions influence people's behavior as much or more than their personal dispositions do. And most people will learn to size up their social circumstances and conform their behavior to the situational demands, whatever that situation is, as long as it's not outside of their normal uh, behavioral routine. The responses they make 
depend heavily on two different factors. Their social roles, how they fit into society, their role as they see it, and the social norms of the group that they belong to, whatever group they belong to. And people can belong to multiple groups, not just one group. So whether you're at a concert, a department meeting, or a pizza parlor, or a movie house, you'll see that people operate by different rules depending on their social roles. The popular girls, no matter where you see them, they're the popular girls. They act like they're part of that group. The jocks, the, the sports guys, they all act very similar no matter where you see them, no matter what role they're in, they are in the role of whatever situation they're in, they're in the role of their jock. You know, they are a jock, they're a sports person. So a social role is one of several socially defined patterns of behavior that are expected of a person in a given setting or group. The roles that you assume may result from your interests. So you may find yourself with other fishermen or hunters or at church or at a bar, depending on your interests or your abilities, sports people and specific abilities right? or your goals. You may find yourself in the social role of the person who is going to be a nurse or a technician of some kind or um, vocational or going to university and you find those people who are have the same goals and you hang around them and that defines your role in life or they can be opposed upon you as well forced upon you by your culture economic conditions the government or biological conditions, certainly a person who has schizophrenia has a role and they're not going to have much more than that role. They are schizophrenic. So it can be imposed on you beyond your control. In any case, social roles prescribe your behavior. And we see how people behave depending on their particular role that they, that they see themselves in. But what would happen if students were given specific roles to play that were nothing like a student's role? And that was the Stanford Prison Experiment. And hopefully you all watched the movie on the Stanford Prison Experiment uh, and the other parts of social psychology that I gave you to watch because I'm going to be referring back to it numerous times. So we saw in that movie that Lewin, uh, a psychologist, studied how leaders affect a group. And we saw that it didn't matter who was in the group, the same group of people given three different leaders, acted very differently depending on the leadership. So the leader pushes the group in a specific direction. And Dr. Phillips and Bardo performed an experiment to determine what social roles do to behavior called the Stanford Prison Experiment, where he took students at Stanford University and made them either prisoners or guards and put the prisoners in a fake prison in the basement of the psychology building at Stanford University. They were randomly assigned these roles and they were not trained to be prisoners or they were not trained to be guards. They were just randomly assigned and then, hey, you're now a guard or you're now a prisoner. The prisoners had to stay in the prison the entire time, 24 hours a day. The guards got to go home at night and do other things besides being guards, just like guards do. Do you think that there's ever a guard at a prison who has not been trained to be a guard given the rules and regulations of the guard? Do you think there's anyone that's ever made a guard that is not given training? You don't know how to answer that one. <laughs> guards are given training. Guards are trained. These guards weren't trained. They had no idea how to be a guard. So how do they learn how to be a guard? Through movies, scripts. We know how to behave like a guard because we've seen guards in movies. Unfortunately, except for maybe three guards that I can think of in the Green Mile, every guard I've ever seen in a movie is a horrible person. And so your script is I'm a guard, I have to be a horrible person. So it's going to go downhill really rapidly. So random assignment decided the new roles as guards or prisoners, and these roles created status and power differences that came out in this situation. 
and no one taught the participants to play their roles, but Dr. Zimbardo did coach the guards, telling them not to let the prisoners get away with anything. And he ended up in the prison experiment himself. This is a no-no. We all, I, I hope I have taught you that a, an experimenter should not be in his or her experiment because it's too much bias that they have about that experiment and it will move the results in a specific direction. And so he is blamed for having this particular experiment go badly because of his role in that experiment, his leadership role in that experiment. As Lewin said, the leader is very important. So each student called upon scripts about the roles they were assigned. A script involves a person's knowledge about the sequence of events and actions that are expected of a particular social role. And one of the problems in this particular experiment is that if a group of guys get together, they like to beat each other up to find out who's the best and who's the worst at being, being beaten up. And, the, um, and then it's a hierarchy. And the person at the top of the hierarchy is usually the most antisocial. Antisocial. So this happened in this, the most antisocial of the guards was the person who ended up to be the head guard. And that leader, along with Dr. Zimbardo, moved this in a really bad direction. So in addition to specific social roles, groups develop many unwritten rules for the way that members should be acting. And these are called social norms a group's expectations regarding what is appropriate and acceptable for a member's attitudes and behaviors. And social norms can be broad guidelines, such as ideas about which political or religious attitudes are considered acceptable by your family or your society. Social norms can also be quite specific, embodying standards of conduct, such as you're quiet in a library, be quiet in a library, or shine your shoes before an interview, make yourself as good looking as possible before an interview. Right. In the Stanford Prison Experiment, the guards quickly developed norms for abusive behavior. Now, this was supposed to be a two-week experiment, two-week experiment, and it lasted five days. At the end of five days, Philip Zimbardo's fiance, who was not part of the experiment but also had her PhD already in psychology, came back from a conference and started watching some of the videos because he was so proud. Look at what they're doing. And he showed her the videos and she was like aghast. She was like, you have to stop this. This is going, how come you can't see this? This is horrible. Stop this before somebody gets hurt. One had already been released because they had a nervous breakdown. So it was stopped after six days instead of going two weeks. And when he wrote it up, he said, no one should ever do this experiment again. They did not believe that in England. In England, they thought, this is his fault. His, this is his fault for being a part of the experiment. He should have stepped back away from the experiment. Uh, and so they decided to do the experiment. And they weren't going to go two weeks. They were going to go two months, two months. And they had a big building built. And they had, so they had a prison. And they put their people in the prison. And they had a camera in every single room. All Every angle of the rooms were, were recorded so that what they were planning on doing was taking that two months of video and making five years worth of a, a reality TV show called The Experiment. It lasted eight days. And again, the reason it broke down was because the most antisocial person became the head of the guards and moved everything in a very antisocial direction. And this is the problem with leadership you need to have leaders who are socially acceptable, pro-social leaders, not anti-social leaders. And we'll talk about pro-social uh, behaviors a little bit later, ne not today. But that's, um, that's the problem. And that's, if you ever get a chance to read the English one, it's a really great experiment because there are some really weird things that happened in that experiment for the, for the eight days that they had it. Uh, and it's a pretty interesting read. So social norms, when a person joins a group, such as a work group or a group of friends, or going to a different school. I, was, I went to lots of different schools, and I have a lot of Coast Guard families here, and Coast Guard families move around just like my family did. My family was Navy, so I was in a different school every three years, at least, sometimes more than that. 
but in the first grade, right? I went to five different first grades. Being in a new building, in a new facility, in a new city, you have to make new friends. And so you learn to make new friends or you fail one or the other. But when you're doing that, you figure out how to fit into the group. What is the group's social norms? And what happens if somebody breaks the social norm? So adjustments to a group typically involve discovering those social norms. Individuals experience this adjustment in two different ways. By, unis by noticing conformity, the uniformities of the particular group, and the behaviors by observing the negative consequences when someone violates a social norm. So if you're a popular girl in one school and then you move to another school, then you want to be a part of the popular girl group again. But this popular girl group, unlike the one you had before, every single one of them, you notice the conformity is they all own Gucci handbags. Very expensive. I can't afford a Gucci handbag. My mom and dad can't afford a Gucci handbag. How? So you're watching to see what happens if somebody doesn't have the Gucci handbag one day and oh, they get teased about it. For, well, heck, <laughs> I can handle that, right? I can do the time. If I can do the time, I'll do the crime. I will join this group and I won't buy a Gucci handbag and I'll let them tease me. Big deal. There used to be a show, Beretta, on television and Sammy Davis Jr. sung the song for Beretta and that was don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do the crime if you can't do the time. Don't do it. Well, there's a problem with that, of course, as I've said in another. That means if you can do the time, go ahead and do the crime. And no, you should not be doing any criminal behavior. This is a little different, right? This is not criminal behavior. But you should not do criminal behavior just because you figure you can, oh, I'll do a year in prison if I do this and get caught. But if I don't get caught, hey, I'm free and clear. No, just don't do the crime. So... This, is a, this, of course, is not criminal behavior. This is just the negative consequences that you see based on what happens when somebody doesn't conform to the group. Well, conformity is a big issue. We can see the effects of social pressure in people's moods, clothing styles, leisure activities. I had a boss at one of my jobs who golfed. He loved to golf. And everybody who went golfing with him ended up being the people that got raises and promotions. And I'm I've golfed. I know how to golf. My grandfather was a pro, so he taught me how to golf. But it's not a big, I don't really like golfing. I'm not really a sports guy anyway. I liked running. That was what I liked to do. I was a runner, um, long distance running. And so I, I, I started golfing. Why? Because I'm falling in line with the other people uh, and I'm mimicking this particular person in charge. It's called the chameleon effect. Right? We tend to imitate other people, our clothing styles, our moods, leisure activities. And this chameleon effect is a conformity. We conform. But can social influence be strong enough to make people follow a social norm that's clearly and objectively wrong? Now, this boss also said we had to wear ties. As, as the managers, we had to wear a shirt and tie. And I hate ties. I despise ties. I really do not like ties. You will very rarely see me in a tie. And I, I went along. I, I put my tie on for a while. And then I got really annoyed with it. And so I went and bought a bolo tie. What is a bolo tie? From Texas. A bolo is two strings of rawhide, basically, with something holding them together. It is considered a tie. So <laughs> he did not mean that's not the kind of tie he's talking about, right? But I have a passive aggressive nature, and so I didn't like him anymore, and so I put on this bolo. Now, if you want me to wear a real tie, according to your definition, you have to rewrite the manual to describe what a tie is. <laughs> so, yeah, I sort of mimicked him, but um, then passive aggressively I was against him. But that's not, you know, a big thing to wear a tie. But what if it's something that is obviously wrong? 
Now, I've told my bosses all my life, and maybe this is why I get hired, because I tell them at the interview process, uh, hey, I will do anything that you want me to do, as long as it's moral and ethical and not breaks my morals and ethics, but I will tell you what I think about it. I'll do it, but I'll tell you what I think it is, stupid or otherwise. Right? And I had one boss that said, well, as long as you tell me in a professional manner, that's fine. There, that's great. I'll know where you stand, but you'll do what I want you to do. As long as it doesn't break my ethics or morals, then I'll quit. Right? So could the power of the situation prove stronger than the evidence of our own eyes? And this is the conformity study by Ash. Solomon Ash set out to answer just such a question with a group rigged to make students think that their eyes were deceiving them. There were nine students, they all got together, and they were talking to each other, having a good time before the experiment ever started, getting to know each other. Eight of eight of those nine were a part of the experiment. The other one did not know that they were all part of the experiment. That one person was the only person that did not know what was going on. So in Ash's study, male college students were told that they were participating in a study of visual perception. They were shown cards with three lines of differing lengths and asked to indicate which of the three lines was the same length as the separate standard line. And the problem was very simple. The lines were different enough so that mistakes were rare in subjects responding alone, but in a group of seven to nine students where the other ones were coached what to say, um, give the wrong answers, everything changed. So they were shown like this down in the right-hand corner, these three lines. And then they, they were shown another line and asked, which line does it match? And obviously, this one matches the middle line. So then, on the first three trials, they were all told the same thing. They were all told, tell the truth. So all nine of them tell the truth. And the last one is always, the one that's in the experience is always the last one. So it goes through this whole list of everybody saying what the right answer is. And he goes, yeah, yeah. Like, this is easy. Right? This is so simple. Right? But the first person to respond on the fourth trial gives an obviously incorrect answer. Reporting is equal two lines that were clearly different. So did the next person and so on until all members of the group, but the remaining one, the real subject, had unanimously agreed on the wrong answer, and then the subject had to decide whether to go along with everybody else's view or remain independent, standing by the evidence of their own eyes and saying, no, that's wrong. And this group pressure was imposed on 12 of the 18 trials, the first three, and then three more during the time so that they could continue the cohesiveness. Oh, yeah, well, we all agreed on this one. That's great. Okay. And then the next one comes along. Like, what? And you could see it in the guy's face in that movie if you watch the movie. Huh? He's like, I don't understand. This is not right. Okay. So what did the other people do? As you can expect, the subject showed signs of disbelief and discomfort when faced with a majority who saw the world so differently from the way that they did. But the group pressure usually prevailed. Three quarters of the subjects conformed to the false judgment of the group. 75% 70, one or more times, while only one-fourth remained completely independent on trials. This is an important number. One Fourth, a quarter of a percent of the people remained independent, said, I don't care what you guys say. This is what it is, and I'm sticking with what I say. But there's another, there's another statistic that's really bad. So in various related studies, between 50 and 80 percent of the subjects conformed with the majority's false estimates at least once. But a third, a th 33 percent of subjects yielded to the majority's wrong judgments on half or more of the critical trials. 33% were so weak-minded that they would follow for more than 50% of the population of the group of time, trials. They would just conform with what the other people said. And social psychologists now call this the Ash effect, the influence of a group majority on the judgment of an individual. And the Ash effect has become the classic illustration of conformity, the tendency for people to adopt the behavior and opinions presented by other group members. Again. The leader is a really important aspect of this, because if the leader is asocial, 33% of the population will accept their asocial behavior 50% or more. Now, by the way, when I said it was this one, it was not this one. It is this one. Whoops. It is the end one. How many of you, when I said it's the middle one, went, wait, no, that's not right. It's got to be the other one. But you didn't say anything. 
I even paused for a second to see if anybody would type in anything. You conformed. <laughs> now, one of the reasons you conformed is because I'm the person in charge and you don't want to say anything about, so that's one of the reasons people conform is because of the people that are around them at the time. So in the further experiments, Ash identified three factors that influence whether a person will yield to a group pressure. The size of the majority, the presence of a partner who dissents from the majority, and the size of the discrepancy between the correct answer and the majority's position. And he found that subjects tended to conform with a unanimous majority of only three people. It only takes three people before somebody will say, okay, I'll go along with the majority, but not two or not one other person. Numerous studies have revealed additional factors that influence conformity, and these experiments have included both females and males. You noticed in the, in the show, uh, in the movie, that all the people in the picture were males, and all of them were white as well because he was teaching at an all-male, all-white institution at the time that he was doing this. So specifically, a person is likely to conform under the following circumstances. When a judgment task is difficult or ambiguous, I'm not really sure what the answer is, so I'll go along with the group. When the group members are perceived as especially competent, that's me. When I said it was the middle one, well, you know, he's the, he's the professor, I guess, Maybe he knows what he's talking about because he's, he's supposed to be competent, right? I hope your teachers are competent. Um, so uh, you will follow along. Now, this was an interesting one because you could take a guy who was an English major, and then when, they, he, was in, when he was introduced to all the other people, they're all math majors. And then you do a math test. You have math questions and come up with math answers. And it's easy math answers. You should know the answers to these math answers. You should be able to do these. And in taking them together, you know, when you're on your own, you can answer these math questions, but put them in, in a group, and well, those are math majors, and I am an English major, so maybe they know more than I do, so I'm gonna conform. That's perceived as especially competent. And when responses are given publicly rather than privately, so you can't conform to somebody if you don't know what their answer is. So privately, obviously, you can't conform to that because you don't know what their answer is. And this is why juries work this way. Juries, the very first uh, vote on a jury, when the jury goes back to, to decide are they guilty or innocent, it is write it down on a piece of paper and put it into a jar. Don't tell us what you think. Just write it on a piece of paper, put it in a jar. That way, the group majority, if there were uh, 12 people on the jury and 11 of them say he's guilty and one person says not guilty, well, that one person may have been swayed over to guilt at the very first vote if if everybody ahead of them was saying guilty, okay, I'm gonna go with guilty then. But if you write it down, you have no idea, and so then as you go through the, the written ballots, you know, oh, well, somebody in here thinks they're not guilty. Well, tell us why. And now at least they get a, a hearing about what their particular view is when they might not have gotten it if they had all been raised your hands if they're guilty right away. So when responses are given publicly, uh, you will conform. When the group majority is unanimous, once that unanimity is broken, the rate of conformity drops drastically. So there's three answers in the one that Ash did, the three different answers. And this is the answer. This is the answer that is, is everybody is saying. Right? But then one person picks this answer, and you think it's this answer. You're not going to say it's this answer. But the unanimity has been broken, and so you're going to say what your answer is, rather than go along with the group because the group's conformity has already been broken. Right? So once that unanimity is broken, a rate of conformity drops dramatically. So this is what happens, and, the, and we use this uh, to our advantage in juries, but the dis when we look at this, we see the issue being decided is complex or confusing, then you're more likely to conform. Others in the group seem to know what they're talking about, you're more likely to conform. You must vote by raising your hand instead of casting an anonymous ballot. Well, you're more likely to conform because you can't, in an anonymous ballot, you can't conform because you don't know what anybody else is doing. And the entire group, without exception, votes in a specific way, you're more likely to conform. That's conformity. But we also conform by being obedient. 
we're supposed to be obedient to our bosses, we're supposed to be obedient to our parents, so we conform by being obedient too, and we're supposed to be obedient to society. Society has certain rules. When somebody is having a problem, we're supposed to help them in some way, shape, or form. Right? So Stanley Milgram uh, performed an experiment that showed that a willingness to follow brutal and even potentially lethal orders is not confined to a few extreme personalities or deranged individuals. Now, you saw this in the movie also, the person who's getting shocked. Right? So this finding, along with certain ethical issues that the experiment raises, places Milgram's work and Philip Zimbardo's work at the center of one of the biggest controversies in psychology, how to deal with your subjects. And because of these experiments, some of these experiments, we now have institutional review boards that say, no, you cannot do this experiment the way you've written it. You are not treating your subjects well. You need to change it so that you change, so you treat your subjects well. Unfortunately, and there are people that do this, institutional review board says you cannot do this experiment the way it's written here in the United States. So they take their experiment and they go to China which doesn't have the same rules and do their experiment in China. That's just, that is, that's wrong. That's just wrong. Um, our morals and ethics are for our society, yes, and it's different than other societies, but you shouldn't be um, bypassing the rules of your own society. Go to China and live there then. You know? <laughs> so the volunteers thought they were participating in a scientific study of memory and learning. Again, the volunteer was one person. There were two people in the experiment, the person who got shocked and the person who did the shocking. When they came together in the room, they said hello to each other, they got a little camaraderie going on, and then the guy in the white coat comes along and says, okay, okay, let's get started. Right? Every single time, the guy that is supposed to do the shocking is the one who's picked out of a hat to do the shocking. And every single time, this actor who the guy doesn't know is an actor and part of the group is the guy that gets shocked. He never gets shocked. He's an actor. He gets hooked up to the electrodes and he gets tied down to an electric chair so he can't move. And the guy that ties him down is the one who's going to do the shocking so the guy knows this guy is tied down to a chair and he can't get out of the chair. So, spe so specifically, the experimenter told them the purpose of the experiment was to discover how learning and memory could be improved through the proper balance of reward and punishment. And cast in the role of the teacher is a volunteer subject that was instructed to punish memory errors made by another person. That other person was the learner, and he was actually a part of the experiment. He was an actor who would fake the fact that he was getting shocked. So to administer punishment, the teacher was told to throw a switch that would deliver an electric shock to the learner each time the learner made an error. And the learner, the guy that's the actor, is told never give the right answer. Always give a wrong answer. So he's always going to get the shock. Moreover, the teacher was told to increase the level of shock by a fixed amount for every new error. And overseeing this whole procedure was the white-coated experimenter. This authority figure presented the rules, arranged for the assignment of the roles through a rigged lot, because it was always, you know, the guy, actor was always the person who was going to get shocked, and ordered the teachers to do their job whenever they hesitated or dissented. And the real question driving the experiment was, how far would subjects go before they defied the authority figure and refused to obey, refused to shock the person? Now, when they were told, Oh, you're going to do the shocking, and you're going to get the shock. You're the, you're the learner. You're the one that's going to get the shocking. And the old man, the actor, he would always scratch his head a little bit and go, well, I have a heart condition, but okay, I'll do it. So not only are you shocking this guy, you're shocking a guy who has a heart condition right, on top of that. Right, so how far would you go? And they were, And Milgram asked people, he said, how, how far do you think people will go? He asked psychologists, how far do you think people will go? He said, well, I think only 2% will go to 450 volts because 450 volts is dangerous. <laughs> your, your electric socket on the wall 
is 120 volts, not 450. And they're going up to 450 volts. That will kill you on the wall. 450 volts will kill you. Right? Now, it's not really the voltage. It's the current that kills you. But, but most people don't know that. 450 volts, oh, my God. And it's labeled dangerous, XXX, 450 volts. So they know it's dangerous. They have no choice. They can't say I didn't know. And they said 2%, because 2% of the population are sadists. They like to, to hurt people and or psychotics. So, you know, they, have, they have a psychosis of some kind. They will actually hurt you. So we have the um, antisocial people who will hurt people, about 2% of the population. No, <laughs> they were way off wrong. The dependent variable was the subject's response measured by the shock level the subject was willing to deliver. The level of shock could be seen clearly on the shock generator and the feature of 30 switches that apparently could deliver shocks 15 volt steps from 15 to 450 volts. And the part of the learner was played by the pleasant, mild-mannered man, about 50 years old. He mentioned having a heart condition, but said he was willing to go along with the procedure. At 75 volts, the script called for this this learner, this uh, actor, to moan and grunt. At 150 volts, he was supposed to demand to be released from the experiment. At 180 volts, he would cry out that he couldn't stand the pain any longer. They did not expect many people to go past 180 volts, but they decided to set down a, a pattern what would happen if they did. The plan then called for the learner's protest to increase with increasing shock levels. For any subject still delivering punishment at 300 volt level, the learner would shout that he could no longer take part in the experiment and must be free. He would also whimper about his heart condition and refuse to reply any further. In other words, he stopped saying anything and replying. And a non-reply is considered a wrong reply, so you have to get shocked. So as you might imagine, the situation is very stressful, not for the guy that's acting, but for the guy giving the shocks. And they would protest and deliver even, ever, even as they delivered it, they would protest about delivering these, but the guy in the experimental white coat would say, you must continue asking the teacher to please continue. You were paid $50 to be a part of this, so you need to continue. The experiment ended only when the shock level reached 450 volts or the person refused to flip, flip the switch any longer. I'm not going to do this. This guy needs help. I'm not, I'm not going to do this anymore. At that point, then it was over. And <laughs> Philip Zimbardo knew Stanley Milgram and asked him, hey, how many times did people just get up to go help this poor guy in the other room who has a heart condition who's complaining about his heart? How many people just got up out of their seat and went to help him? And Stanley Milgram said, no one, not one, not ever. They all asked permission to go help the person. They never got up on their own to go help the person. So in fact, the majority of subjects obeyed the authority figure fully. Two thirds, 66% delivered the maximum 450 volts to the learner. 466% of us are horrible people. <laughs> and no subject who got within five switches of the end refused to go all the way. If they, if they hit the sixth switch and there were only five left, every single one of them went through. There was nobody that quit in this five group. No one quit within the five group. They might quit at the sixth, but if they flipped that sixth one, they were going all the way. They had already, their resistance was broken. They'd already resolved all their conflicts. They just wanted to get it over with as quickly as possible. And these were not sadistic people who obeyed happily. Most of them dissented verbally, and you could see that in the movie that you watched. Even though they continued to deliver the shocks, all the while they protested loudly to the experimenter, but the experimenter responded to with stern commands. Oh, you have to, you have no other choice. You must go on. And even when there was only silence from the learner's room, this is horrible. When there was only silence from the learner's room, the teacher was ordered to keep shopping, shocking them more and more all the way up to the bottom, up, up to the button that said, Danger, severe shock, XXX, 450 volts, and 66% of the population obeyed. To a man who was not responding anymore, he could be dead. He could be dead. And you were still shocking him. Human beings are not the nicest people in the world. This is Milgram's experiment. 
Of course, no shocks were ever delivered. This guy was an actor. And the victim of the shocks, the actor, um, he talked to the teacher afterwards. They came out you know, and said, I'm fine. I did not get shocked. You're OK. This is called debriefing a person. Once a person's, to get a person into an experiment, they have to have informed consent. You have to tell them as much about the experiment as you can without giving it away, because that could ruin the results. And then afterwards, you debrief them. You tell them, this is what actually happened. This is what we were actually looking for, so that they know what they did. And the controversy about Milgram's research concerns the ethics of inflicting mental harm, not physical harm, because the other guy didn't get any shocks. It's the mental harm on the guys throwing the shocks, because they were freaking out. They were freaking out that they were giving all these shocks to this person. So we now have independent review boards, which will review proposals for experiments today and determine if the experiment should proceed as written or should be modified to fit the ethical and moral standards of society. Do you understand Milgram's experiment? A lot of people don't recognize, you did, yes, 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 I'm seeing less. A lot of people don't recognize the fact that no one ever got shocked in that. That's not the point of the, the point was how far would they go if they thought they were shocking somebody. So why do we obey authority? Well, in all, Milgram tested more than 1,000 subjects, including women. And from the many variations Milgram conducted in his original study, we concluded the subjects tended to be obedient under the following conditions. One, when a peer modeled the obedience by complying with the authority figure's commands, then subjects are more likely to obey all the way. In other words, you're coming into this experiment, and um, you're and you're early. Oh, you're early. Come here. Here's a guy that's doing it right now. You know, he's, we can watch through this, this uh, mirrored glass, right? He doesn't know we're watching. But you can see, oh, you know him? Oh, really? Oh, oh he's in your, in your department. Oh, really? Okay. So, and you watch that person go to 450 volts. You're more likely to go to 450 volts because it's a peer that modeled the behavior first. When the victim is remote from the subject and could not be seen or heard, well, if you can't see him and hear him, then you don't know how much damage you're doing to them, and so you go all the way to the end. If you can hear them, there's less likely, and if you can see and hear them, you're less likely to go all the way to the end as well. When the teacher is under direct surveillance of the authority figure, and that's what you saw in the movie, the, the, teacher, um, the teacher was right there in the room with the man in the white coat, the lab coat, telling him, no, you must continue, continue. But if it was over loudspeakers instead, which is another version that they did, under, over loudspeakers, then people were not as likely to go all the way to um, the 450 volts. Right? They're more obedient if you're right there with them. Uh, when a subject acted as an intermediary bystander, in other words, you come into the experiment and the guy says, this is our shock box, but it's very delicate, and this person has been trained how to use it, so he's going to throw the switches, not you. You just tell him to throw the switch, and he'll throw the switch. So you're not throwing the switch. You're not culpable, right? So those people, they went all the way to the end. They, I didn't have to throw the switch. I just told the guy to throw the switch. Not my fault, right, if, if the guy dies. So they're much more obedient if they don't have to throw the switch. And the military knows this. The military knows that you take a person that is, has more authority, and you tell that person to get somebody else to throw a switch, and that's what's going to happen. Right? So when the authority figure has higher relative status than the subject, as when the subject was a student and the experimenter was billed as a professor or doctor, they're more obedient. But if the person, if the person who is throwing the switches, the teacher, is somebody who owns a business in the, in the town, and they come in to do this experiment, and the person in the lab coat is a professor, PhD, in psychology, um, they're more likely to conform. But if the person coming in is a owner of a business and the man in the white coat is just a student getting their bachelor's degree, hi, I'm doing this, I got my bachelor's degree, and this is the experiment I have to do to get my bachelor's degree, they're less likely because they have more status than the student does. They already have their bachelor's degree. They're already working out in the real world. They already have a business of their own. So they have more relative status than the student. And they're less likely to conform at that point. But this is 
Now, this is the military. This is what the military does. The general gets a lieutenant to find a sergeant to, to throw the switch. <laughs> and the, the lieutenant's going to do it because the general told him to do it. And the lieutenant's going to do it because he doesn't get to have to throw the switch. He's going to get somebody else to throw the switch. And again, he has more authority over the sergeant. He's a higher authority figure than the sergeant does. So it, it works. <laughs> Unfortunately, 66% of us. So personality tests administered to the subjects did not reveal any traits that differentiated those who obeyed from those who refused and did not identify any psychological disturbances or abnormalities in the obedient punishers, the 66%. These findings enable us to rule out personality as a variant in obedient behavior. And what about gender? Well, women did just as badly as men did, 66% uh, of women as well were just as obedient as men. And obedience is not simply defined by following an authority figure. As I said, society has rules for us as well, and sometimes we don't follow those societal rules either. Our obedience to society fails us, and this is the bystander effect. And uh, some of you may already know the story of Kitty Genovese. Any of you know, have heard of Kitty Genovese in other classes? Uh, they like to talk about it in English class sometimes. So some of you have heard of Kitty Genovese. So this is a true story. This has actual happened. And uh, Kitty Genovese was attacked, stabbed, raped, and killed. So at approximately 3.20 a.m. on the morning of March 13, 1964, 20-year-old Mrs. Catherine Kitty Genovese was returning to her home in a nice middle-class area of Queens, New York from her job as a manager of a bar. She's a white collar worker, not a blue collar worker. She's making some good money. She has some power. She's working, or she's living in a really nice area of New York. And she parks her red Fiat in a nearby parking lot, turns off the lights and starts to walk toward her second floor apartment. And uh, a man grabs her and stabs her. She screams. Lights go on in the apartment buildings nearby. And she yells, oh, my God, he stabbed me. Please help me. And windows open up in the apartment buildings. And a man's voice shouts out, let that girl alone. And the attacker looks up and shrugs and walks off down the street. And Mrs. Genevieve struggles to get to her feet. Lights go off in the apartment buildings. And the attacker comes back. And he finds her in the hallway of her, in the, in the foyer of her building, there's um, a, a room here, an apartment here, another apartment, another apartment, and steps that go up. So there's four apartments and then steps to go up to the second floor. She's on the first floor. He attacks her again. She screams again. One of the doors opens up and then closes. The only reason we know that is because the guy, when he was asked by police officers, what did you hear or do? And he tells them, I saw it. I saw the guy. I know who it is and closed the door back up again. So when um, the first person calls, it's 30 minutes after the first attack. 30 minutes, and the police get there within two minutes. If they had called immediately, this is our obedience to society. If they had called immediately, she would have been okay. Right? But Mrs. Genovese was already dead when they arrived. The only person to have called was a neighbor of Mrs. Genovese that revealed that he had phoned only after much thought and an earlier phone call to a friend. He called a friend first to find out what he wanted, what he should do. He said, I didn't want to get involved. Later, it was learned that there were 37 other witnesses to the stabbing and stalking that occurred over a period of a half an hour. The attacker was later arrested and sent to prison, and he died in prison of old age. He, he was very lucky to have died of old age. <laughs> Any of you recognize the name Genovese? Do any of you recognize the no? The turn the, the no? Nobody knows Genovese. <laughs> in my day, you knew Genovese quite well. But I lived in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, New York, New Jersey, the Genovese Mafia family, well known. <laughs> and she was the niece of one of the Dons. He was a dead man walking. He was lucky to have died of old age. So as citizens, we know what is expected of us. These people knew they should have helped. Why did none of these 37 witnesses call police earlier when it would have helped? And they were just lambasted in the news, in the radio, television, on the newspapers. They just 
tore these people up for not having done what they were supposed to do. And that's called the fundamental attribution error, and we'll talk about that later in, this, uh, in these lectures. But the bystander problem has been studied by psychologists as well. So in studies presenting subjects with contrived emergency situations, researchers have found that the best predictor of bystander intervention was the situational variable of group size. The likelihood of intervention decreases as the group size increases because each person assumes that others will help. If there are only two people watching something, then each one of them has a duty, 50% duty, to call 911. But if there are 100 of us, then each one of us only has a 1-100th responsibility, duty, to call. And there's a way to break this, too. Now, you know this now, so if you ever come across a situation, don't get hooked up by the bystander. Call. Call. But if you don't have a phone, point to somebody that does as loud as you can so everybody hears you. You. Call 911. And it will pull all that back down. His is the responsibility now to call 911 instead of talking to his friend while watching what's going on. So individuals who perceive themselves as part of a large group of potential interveners experience a diffusion of responsibility, a dilution or weakening of each group member's obligation to act when responsibility is perceived to be shared with all group members. Another factor was obviously also at work as well as conformity. As you remember from Ash's studies of conformity, when people don't know what to do, they take their cues from other people. Well, here they are, 100 people standing around doing nothing. I guess I can do nothing too. I'm conforming with everybody else. So the bystander effect is um, when the more bystanders present, the less likely any one of them will be to act, and the slower any one of them will be to act if they do act. And there are three reasons for this, and we'll talk about those when we come back on uh, Thursday. So if there are any questions, please stay and talk to me. If you haven't put your name in to the chat box, please put your name in the chat box so I know you're here. And otherwise, I'll see you on Thursday. Have a good Wednesday. Stay healthy. Bye. Hannah, you got a question? Nope. Morgan, do you have a question? Nope. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're done. <laughs>